I would definitely say, so our, our course is the first 10 questions you would ask on your financial journey, beginning with why do I care about money today? Because the pension system, social security system are not going to be dependable. You probably won't get a pension all the way to what is my best advantage as a young professional, as a student today. Um, so what I would really emphasize is the idea that this course is not meant to just educate. Education is a vital piece to the puzzle. Financial literacy is amazing if it translates to action. This is Better Wealth with Caleb Williams. Jedediah, welcome to the Better Wealth Show. Caleb, it has been a journey that you and I have been on. It is only fitting that we connect here, and I just really appreciate the opportunity to share my message with your audience that is growing daily, brother. I'm so excited for you. Man, I am so excited to have you on, and it's so funny because it's like we, we got on here, and I was like, all right, what are we going to talk about? Because you w- could literally create multiple courses <laughs> on behavior, on sales, on how to get through, how, how to get through life, how, to, how money works, and so it's like so funny and we could honestly have our own podcast. So let's just file let's that try. away. Yeah. Let's back burner. Um, <laughs> we're learning. Entrepreneurs, you got to have priority number one and back burner. But very, very similar to that is w- everybody gets introduced to me or a brand or businesses in different lights in different ways. And truly what I want people to eventually see me as is that cross section. And it's, so it's taking all sides of me and really meshing it together because my mindset and behavioral side doesn't feel like the same as my money vehicle, financial literacy education side. But in essence, what I ultimately want is people to go act upon what they have learned. And so I do see a crossover in kind of what I'm doing. And I'm hoping as as people get to know me and our message more, they'll start to see how the dots connect as well. Yeah, I, I, it's very clear to me how the dots connect. And so I'm grateful, again, that you're here. Um, if we were in an elevator together, and it was, a, it was you know, let's say 100 stories. So it's it's a <laughs> long, uninterrupted way. We're to- obviously six feet apart, but keep going. Right, right. <laughs> how would you share? How would you share your background? Because it's impressive. Ooh, I, yeah. I love hearing people's origin story. Um, yep. And so who is who is Jedediah? What what has gone into making you who you are today? Okay, so not what I am doing today. Who is Jedediah? You know, I I come from a big family. I'm the fourth of five. And why I bring that up is because I define myself as a great failure. Um, Growing up, I played basketball in the backyard against my brothers every day. And they were older than me. They were taller than me. They were better basketball players than me. And so I lost every day. My dad actually invented a game called Kink for a Day. And I vividly remember the two days I walked off the court as king as champion but what I came to realize out on that court was I was not going to be able to judge my days and wins and losses or if I was king I was going to have to judge my my measurement against did Jed get better maybe I didn't win but if I got better that was success and so I began at a young age being able to not only take feedback as failure but also learn and grow from it and so even today I take that message, I am a great failure because I don't see it as an end, I see it as a true beginning. And as an entrepreneur, I'm starting to realize all of those no's, you you talk to any any entrepreneur, they've heard no 10 times more than they've heard yes. But all of those no's give you clarity. And my failures, my clarity from getting cut 12 times in the NFL have only allowed me to grow. And so if you were to look at me, it would be a, a kid who, who played football, got to go chase a dream in the NFL, was afraid of not capturing the dream and afraid of what the game was going to physically do to me. And it drove me to my next passion in finance and teaching people about money. But ultimately, I see myself as an individual, as somebody who, who now leans in and welcomes failure because through failure, we grow. I love it, man. Were you obsessed about football in high school and college? And did you focus on anything other than that? 
So interesting enough, my family's all basketball. My dad played Division One, was drafted NBA, ABA. Both my brothers played Division One basketball. They were also like 6'5", 200 pounds, and I was 6'1", 250 pounds. So maybe there's some some, some nature or something telling me that basketball wasn't going to be my thing. But I didn't, you know, my first NFL game that I went to was the one I was playing in. Um, we grew up without television, so I didn't grow up watching sports or football, but we were always student athletes, even, you know, going to college uh, as a, a scholarship athlete, my parents and my father in particular was very clear on the idea of getting an education. And so I was always obsessed with sports. I was always deemed jock and deemed the athlete, but really trying to identify myself and actually running from those stereotypes and how am I more than and I began that with you know journaling with sharing some of my thoughts and processes um, and so yeah no the game has become my passion and become my love but no I grew up uh, I grew up a Lakers fan which we just won a 17th NBA title so we're, we're on top again. So I want I want you to walk us through NFL because you are you are undrafted you're a walk on mm -hmm. um you you just said that you were cut twelve times yeah what, what was that like and you played more than one season so like talk talk to me about what that was like uh, before then we get into the tra transition the, the yeah. game goes on after but I'm just so fascinated that you're so humble and yet you played at the highest level and it's it's so funny because I was gonna say. Oh, well, you got to show your your family like, oh, like you you are gonna win, but yet you're you're. It sounds like you're one of many very talented uh, athletes in your family. Yeah. So the NFL was absolutely a dream come true, one that went from dream to a goal. Even my senior year in college, I, I wasn't truly a starter until my senior year, and one of my big questions was, how was I going to transition? What position was I going to play at that next level? I was a linebacker in high school, a tight end in college, and a fullback in the NFL. And saying that shows, you know, I have some athletic gifts, but truly it's it's pivoting, it's adjusting, it's getting on a team and just saying, where can I add value? And that's really where I came to develop who I was. So being undrafted is is the first gut check, the first humbling, you know, day as you have friends and family kind of over on draft day and you're, I was projected fourth round, fifth round. So I was expecting a call. Um, and you, you really get introduced very quickly, regardless of who you are after the first pick, you're disappointed. The second pick of the draft wanted to go number one. And you realize I am no longer a big fish in a small pond or a middle sized pond. I am now a small fish in the ocean. And I'm not just competing against, you know, my friends, I'm competing against everybody in the world. And I had to do that as I transitioned positions, becoming a lead blocking fullback, which is a mindset shift. It's a, it's a, a position that is selfless and is a position of will over skill. Are you willing to go and do it? Because there's pain involved in moving human beings against their, their will. Um, so in my process, I got cut a dozen times. I got to go to a tremendous amount of teams. I got a lot of free gear that I get to still work out in and kind of spite. Um, my wife says they're getting kind of stinky and I need to throw them away, but I still, it, it's hard. Yeah. Um, but what I challenged myself to do, getting cut the first time, getting cut the 12th time in Dallas was the same feeling. A shot to the heart, my emotions running high, my dream was coming to a, an end and crumbling before me. And it is truly a, a really, really interesting moment, which is why I challenge people to, to journal because I have most of the days I got cut in journal. Um, but what I challenged myself to do was, was grow through failure. Each locker room I left, I started to look at the veterans, an eight-year safety, a 12-year lineman, a 20-year kicker. What were those people doing that I wasn't doing? And a realization I came to was there is a big difference between who I am and who I want to be or a goal I want to go and achieve. That difference is a backhanded compliment called potential. And I began to realize like I hated potential. Potential meant I could do it and I wasn't. It, it meant I had all the ingredients, but not the recipe. And so what I challenged myself to do is each locker room I left, what was one behavior I could steal 
yeah. from the best yeah. in the world. And I do not say steal accidentally. I mean steal. So what did that guy do on a daily basis that I'm just going to take and put into my process? And I think and more of us need to look at that idea of stealing success more clear because I, I went from undrafted being cut 12 times to the number one ranked fullback, the best in my world, and the, the best in the world at something based on stealing success, based on stealing behaviors, mindset, stealing principles, and truly just taking from the best around me. So uh, my journey through the NFL was tremendous. It was, it was humbling at every twist and turn. It was the most competitive experience and environment I think you can imagine. But at the end of the day, the, the failures of getting cut led me to not only growing as a person, but the reality that my journey ended before it even began showed me a light that football was only a, a moment in time and I was going to have to prepare for whatever was to come next. Yeah. I, I have to ask, what was the number one thing that you stole as far as uh, taking from a locker room? Oh, well, I have a list of 10, so I call him rookie to veteran. But the number one, I would say, was working out with a linebacker in Kansas City. And so I got lumped into the big skill. You know, the skilled guys are fantasy players. The big guys are the offensive and defensive linemen. And then big skill are like these hybrid. And so I was working out next to the linebackers. And he was a 15-year veteran. And I noticed it as we ran sprints one day. We'd run 40 yards, he'd run 45. We'd run 50, he'd run 55. We'd go into the weight room. He would encourage us, and he'd be the last one in our group to do a lift. We put on 225. Right before he went, he'd slide on a two and a half on each side and make it 230, and then maybe he'd do a set of 11. We'd go be required to get two game tapes. He'd get a third. Finally, I just asked him. One of my secrets of success is I ask the dumb or the curious question, Again, I would recommend and challenge you to do that because you will, you will be gladly surprised. But I asked him, I said, I don't get it. Like, what does five pounds matter? Like, is it just hard to slow, on the, slow down on the field because you're old? You know, you're 37. Like, that's – and he, he said, look around, man. We were in the middle of a locker room. He said, look around. Every guy in here is here to take my job. 15 years, every guy in here is to here to take my job. They're younger. They're faster. They're hungrier. They're healthier. The only reason I'm still here, the only reason I can still compete is I come in every day and I steal this. I steal an inch because an inch leads to a yard, a yard to a first down, a first down to a touchdown, a touchdown to a win. And wins provide an opportunity to go to what I want most, which is the Super Bowl. And that concept blew me away. It was so simple. It is so simple and it is not easy. What does that inch represent? Well, Oddly enough, as a lead blocking fullback, my measurement of success was six inches. So I looked at it and I said, if Monday through Saturday, I could steal an inch on my comp competition, whatever that is, Saturday is recovery day. Where is my inch there? If I can steal those six inches throughout the week, I can go out on Sunday and win that six inch battle. And so that concept to me really played through in my football career. But you translate the game of inches into finances and you start to see compound interest the aggregation of marginal gains and really truly seeing how significant subtle little decisions we have can be. And you, you see how ma massive and, and, and major it could be in your career and your, your mindset. Well, man, you're, you're very articulate and it's very, it's very clear that you are a winner at heart. You have that humility, but you have that work ethic. And so what I want to do now is I want to transition over to you're done with football. Mm. Uh, how was what was going through your head there and then what got you into the financial service industry were you like already passionate about money while you were in football or is it one of those things where it's like all right what do I do now my first thoughts as I began to get done so I was very fortunate I chose to walk away from the game of football um, I did get cut my last time in Dallas but I had plenty of opportunities to keep going and playing uh, but it was I, I was afraid um, the game is violent. There's there's a risk to the reward. And I got to a point where that wasn't balanced anymore. It was it was kind of hay, weighing on one side. So um, the idea of going into the financial industry was everything because it gave me a direction to head. Um, so many athletes get lost because your only identification is sports, ball. That's it. And so I had something else, but it, again, it was that work ethic side. It was because I got cut so many times 
my second year, I started to study for the certification of financial planning. I didn't even know what it was. And so actually I, I discovered it and started to sign up for it. My second year, I started studying for it my third year. Um, and so each off season, I would attack the CFP process to where when I walked away after seven years, I was able to sit for and start to take the certification and be ready to go into the real world as an advisor, as a wealth manager. I obviously needed to go get the hours of experience, but the educational side was taken care of. And that uh, kind of light bulb came with my first paycheck, my rookie year. You know, I, just like most athletes, got my first paycheck and spent it before I even opened the envelope. Um, now, I, I love to dis give a disclaimer. You know, I bought an engagement ring and my wife and I are still very happily married. But to this day, I will tell her that was a very poor financial decision like that. That was not a good way to handle money. But I was a spender. We we're all spenders. You, you get money, you spend money. It's a day to day mindset. And so then I began to shift to a saver, started to look year to year. But it wasn't until my education started to grow that I saw this language and the secret of the wealthy to become an investor. Yeah. So I love asking people, what type of or are you? Spend or, save or, invest or. Yeah. And truly, I saw the NFL, I saw the opportunity, but I also saw the difference between being rich and being wealthy and how many of us get lost in this idea of rich and having money today and don't realize how to manage it or turn it into many tomorrows that we don't have to worry about money, that is true wealth. Yeah. So I, I start to look at this thing and I say, okay, finances is where I want to go. All I really knew was be an advisor, but it wasn't until a couple of years in the industry that I started to find my passion around educating, around teaching, and really around launching out on a mission to help people begin their journeys not as a wealth manager or financial advisor where people are typically down the road or at the end of their yeah. journeys. Yeah. And that's one thing that really separates you from a lot of people in our industry. What was your moment? I, I remember mine really vividly. It's like I'm at, I'm working at the bank and I'm just, I'm just looking around and obviously this is a small community, but I'm looking around and going like, why is everyone broke? I think ah, it was like the, the, the third time that day that I had to tell somebody like they wanted to retire. And it was like, where they thought they were and where they were was like yeah. not even close. And I was like, why, why, like, why does, why do we have to do this? Why, why are people working so hard and they don't have a fraction of what they have? Mm -hmm. What was your like moment where you're like, man, I got to take this thing to the next level. It's not okay for me to just exist. Like I gotta, I gotta actually help people because you are on a mission, my friend. And it's clear in the book that you've written in the course that you're on that the, the partnerships that you're making. So what was that moment for you? So, I mean, people want to point to athletes and like wag the finger, like, why doesn't this 22 year old know what to do with $10 million? You line up any 122 year olds and give them $10 million. They won't, they, none of them are going to end up with $10 million. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say it was like this realization. I would say it was twofold. One, when my brothers, my one brother, when I was talking to him was getting a master's in engineering at, at Berkeley. The other brother was getting his Harvard law school degree. When I started to talk to them and realize these guys don't have the money class either. You know, Jed, the big dumb jock, rookie in the NFL has got, you know, $25,000. What should I do with it, guys? No idea. Blank stares. Eventually, they began asking me about money. That was an enlightening moment. And then being in wealth management and talking to my fifth doctor surgeon, who made $700,000 last year and, and humbly telling them they weren't a client because they didn't meet our minimum criteria of having a million dollars of investable net worth. They've been surgeons for over a decade, making a half a million dollars plus for over a decade. And yet they had no worth, net worth. They were very rich. They were very poor in wealth. And so it was really that realization that I looked at and I said, how is this possible? Like, why don't people understand yeah. the difference that it was those conversations just like you had on a different scale, but still the same realization that people just don't understand this language. And I wanted to try to uh, challenge that from a different medium and a different way to tell a story and really seek out a way to engage and entertain people while they learned about the subject of money. Right. Um, what I want to now transition to is the framework. How you, if you, if we were to sit across the table from each other 
and you were to say, okay, Caleb, this is, this is like the framework of how to think about money. Hmm. Where would that begin? And I want to tee you up by saying you have a, you have an Alice in Wonderland um, yes. video you that when I saw in your <laughs> course, I was like, we are brothers. We because are. I love that story. And that is what is so neat is you saw that, you know that story, you've used that story because it is so good. People don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel and stories bring things to life. So it is no different than an, an athlete going for a championship, an uh, entrepreneur going for a successful business, somebody dealing with their personal finances, you must begin with the end in mind. You must begin with that destination. Money is not the destination. And I really want to make sure people understand that clarity. We call it money vehicle. We call it your money vehicle because you are in the driver's seat, nobody else. And money is a vehicle. Money is a verb, a tool that is going to help you and empower you to do, arrive at that destination. So when people say, well, I want a million or 10 million or whatever dollars, I say, well, think through the lifestyle. Start to really play through. What are you doing tomorrow? If you have $10 million in your bank account, that is what the destination is. Yeah. And that is what people need to start to visualize. So when I make that daily decision, I'm not sacrificing. The, one of the greatest skills of success is to prioritize what you want most over what you want right now. And so you don't sacrifice, you prioritize. And as you look at money, you begin to realize it's daily decisions where I prioritize my most over now. And I always am envisioning those goals, those dreams, those things I want to achieve. Um, and looking at it through just that time horizon of, all right, now I understand today has a bigger impact over a long-term time period because I am an investor. I love it. I love it. All right. Framework. I know this is, this is hard because it's obviously yeah. you wrote, you wrote a book and by the way, I know the, how hard this is. Yes, you do. As a and, and, published and your author. book is like twice as big as mine <laughs> and you actually put a whole money course. That's like Not the size get... that matters. Caleb. <laughs> uh, so, but so obviously, you know, one of the, one of the tough things is summarizing and simplifying, yeah. but you get it, man. So again, you you left the the industry mm -hmm. working with people one on one to educate to increase the financial literacy. Thank you because like we need more of you. And what what is financial literacy? And if you had like five minutes to like share with someone something and and you only had the back of a napkin, what mm -hmm. would you make sure to communicate? So. I would definitely say, so our, our course is the first 10 questions you would ask on your financial journey, beginning with why do I care about money today? Because the pension system, social security system are not going to be dependable. You probably won't get a pension all the way to what is my best advantage as a young professional, as a student today. Um, so what I would really emphasize is the idea that this course is not meant to just educate. Education is a vital piece to the puzzle. Financial literacy is amazing if it translates to action. And so why I say we're not out to just educate, we're out to empower is because empowerment means you have the confidence to act. And that is our true north. That is our North Star. How many accounts can we open? How many mindsets can we change? How many behaviors can we create? That is what the money vehicle course and system is all about. So if I was going to summarize the book, it, it walks through an introduction to goal setting. And then we have to understand what money does as it works. So what is interest? What is that eighth wonder of the world? Time value of money. And then chapter three goes into a cash management system. Now that I'm starting to identify habits, create repeated success, what is my habit around my paycheck? How do I handle my paycheck? Do I have a high level system? We call it money buckets. It's the five choices you have. Chapter four goes into your first teammate, which is going to be a bank. Bankers, banking, how to automate different accounts, how to utilize those different accounts. Chapter five, the first mistake most people make around their money is the credit trap. How do you avoid the credit trap? Chapter six, because everybody wants to talk about the sexy engine that roars in your money vehicle, we dive into investments. I am not 
a day trading guru. I am not showing you how to get rich quick. I do want to introduce you to one of the greatest platforms, technology, and some great minds from Vanguard and Jack Bogle, rest in peace, around the index fund and why it can be such an advantage for an early investor. Then you dive into insurance. Now that I understand I'm taking on some risk, how do I transfer that? And what are insurance policies? What are premiums, deductibles, all those kinds of questions? Then we get into something that is typically not found in financial literacy, cybersecurity. Yeah. Why? Because in our world today, money goes hand in hand with technology, apps, and security. So you need to be on alert because there is a war and a battle going on. Chapter nine, because and we save the best for last, taxes, because everybody gets excited for it. I will say I've gotten great reviews on how we teach. So each chapter has different characters, different lessons, different stories. Chapter nine, taxes, gross to net income. We go to an ice cream parlor. And I've had students from all over the country, college students, one, one young gentleman from Harvard say, I took accounting at Harvard. The ice cream thing was better explained than anything I took over here, which I want to just frame and put up somewhere as a big You're billboard. Like, can you say that one more time? Can I'm going to turn me, and hit record. Yeah. Uh, and then chapter 10 is looking at accounts, looking at vehicles, brokerage, 401k, Roth. Which one is your best advantage? Which one should you go open? How to open it? And then what to make your money go to work for in it? So that's a high level summary of the kind of 10 questions and topics that we cover. As you are, I try to give a holistic view because we realize it's not just investments anymore. Investments are great, but you don't control that much of the stock market, if yeah. anything at all. So we really need to learn how to plan and stop trying to predict what is going to happen. Right. One of the one of the things I try to communicate is you are your number one asset. You're, you're quite mm. frankly the derivative that makes everything in your life possible, good or bad. And and if we don't even have the right knowledge, if we don't have the right mindset, good luck. Good um, luck. I, I'm just I'm just curious. So you you kind of put a teaser out there. Part of what makes your course so powerful is you you speak on a you and me level. With the ice cream parlor, can you give us a little bit more? Like, can you explain taxes? Because I feel like we have accredited investors in our community yeah. who don't really understand how taxes work. No. And so, it. I mean, so to try to do it without the visual, you, you try to say, what does everybody understand? So everybody understands ice cream scoops. And so I come in and I say, hey, <clears throat> Caleb, what's your favorite scoop of ice cream? And I hope it's not vanilla, because as I ask students in rooms full of people, when kids say vanilla, I, I chastise them in front of the entire group. I say, you got to get more creative. Right. Baskin Robbins didn't get created off of one flavor. But <laughs> that's just a personal like fat kid moment because I love ice cream. Um, so <clears throat> one student comes in and says, hey, I love ch mint chocolate chip. Great. I'm going to give you that for a quarter. Now, the second student comes in and says, well, I love Rocky Road. Awesome. I want three scoops of Rocky Road. That's great. I charged them a quarter for their first scoop. So for your first scoop of ice cream, I'm going to charge you a quarter. For that second scoop of ice cream, I'm going to charge you 50 cents. And for your third scoop of ice cream, I'm going to charge you 75 cents. Why would I do that? And a lot of people say, well, that's not how they charge. I say, I know, but watch why I do that. I do that so everybody's first scoop of ice cream is charged the same price. Now, you throw up a progressive income tax bracket code and you see it's nothing but brackets are ice cream scoops. So everyone gets charged the same for that first scoop of ice cream. Jeff Bezos and me are charged the same as this, the first person, at, first employee tomorrow at Amazon. We are all changed, charged the same on that first scoop of ice cream. And then you build up from the brackets and the ice cream scoops as you go down. And you give that analogy, you give the visual to students and you see the light bulb go off. And all of a sudden they say, oh, I get how that works. That makes more sense. And yeah. that is all we're trying to do. Yeah. Because then once you realize progressive, how gross to net works, now we can start talking about deductions, elections, and different ways to reduce or avoid taxes. Yeah, if I had a dollar for every time someone says, I want to do this. So I, I'm not in the highest tax Next. bracket. I'm like, oh. okay. I'm like, yes. But then we, I, I'm going to use, I'm going to get my ice cream scooper out the next time and, and say, okay, let's not, 
Hey. Let's, let's let's be educated. You're you're not all you're not being taxed 100 percent at the highest tax bracket. So gosh, um, and that's, you, that's a great as, example, right? And if you want a like a a little speaker or presenter tip, bring some real ice cream. You want to talk, make taxes even fun? Like yeah, in two minutes you guys are gonna get scoops of ice cream. But wait, I got to tell you something real quick. That's just a little extra. Yeah. Little yeah. B- biggest mistake you're seeing people make. In in around their money is thinking that the inches don't add up in thinking, well, I don't have enough to start or it's not gonna matter or I, you know, not even setting a goal. Um, so I would maybe say that. So I would say number one is not setting a goal. There's something, and you know, 80% of statistics are made up. So there's something like 10% of people have written goals down. Yeah. You, I know you enough, you have written goals down. Not just for like, the business at large, but probably for next month or 2020 or a quarter. Very few people do that. And when you don't have those goals, you don't see success. You don't see the daily progress. And then you start to say, well, it doesn't even matter. So I would say number one mistake is people don't write down their goals. Number two is they don't realize their daily decisions do add up. And you look at the latte example, you look at time value money, all of those things are massive. And, and they really do add up. I, I saw a, a thought experiment from Bill Ackman a, a couple months ago that every child in America, forget social security, forget retirement, forget 401ks. You give every child in America $6,700 at birth and just invest it and don't touch it for 65 years, they'll retire a millionaire. And it's like, wait, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's because they they start to understand. They set a goal, they took action, and they let it you know let it go to work. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's, in, it's interesting. Sixteen years old, I wrote, I wrote down on a piece of paper what I'm doing right now. I want to <sighs> do something in the financial service business that doesn't just help a few people, but goes goes big. The other thing is our principle number three at Better Wealth is about consistency. Because if you mm-hmm. look back on the successful people, they're consistent. In, in the way that they show up in their morning routine and the, what they're doing with their money and in what they're, what's going on between both their ears. And so I love that man. Um, yeah, again, I, I, I could, I could ask you a hundred oh, yeah. questions and on, on other conversations we have talked a lot, but I first of all want to be like, I want to help people go to, to support you, but more importantly, take what you've already done and help their schools, help their family, help Mm -hmm. their um, people, help high performers, whether you're an athlete or whether you're making um, money, like how can, how can they like start supporting what you're doing and and just get the book and like, what's the best way to stay in touch? So I would say, I would challenge people. If you know groups, high school, colleges, you know, clubs, sports teams, whatever, who would benefit from a financial literacy curriculum, we end it with the certification, which has proven to be a great resume builder. So you will be earning a financial literacy certification. Reach out. Uh, fullback of finance on social media platforms. LinkedIn is just Jedediah Collins. But my website, JedediahCollins.com. We also have a website straight to the course. That is yourmoneyvehicle.com forward slash drive, as in begin to drive your money vehicle. Go to the website. Check it out. We have the ability to scale this thing. We have thousands of people now signing up. We have groups with thousands of people that at the click of a button can provide this resource. Everybody for the last 30 years has been saying, why isn't this taught in school? Why, where is the class? Where's the subject? That question has been itching me for 12 years since my rookie year. That is why Caleb, you do, I do, we are creators. That's why Money Vehicle built this program, built this business, is because I was tired of people saying, oh, well, we just, it can't, it, you can't do it. We can do it. And it's going to happen. This, this movement around Money Vehicle, this movement around financial empowerment has begun. Yeah. And with technology today, we are, have the cap- capability of reaching and empowering more people. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks to you, man, and and many others that you and I both know, we're suffocating yeah. the e- excuse of uh, there's no no one teaching financial literacy. There, there's platforms out there, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that. I end all my interviews with with what I call the legacy question. So let's take yeah. off her money hat. All right, put on your father hat. 
And if you were with your 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 kids, your future kids, with with your with your lovely wife and the people that you love the most, and this was your last day on earth, hmm. what what would you make sure to pass down in in that last conversation? You can't give them anything tangible other than what you've learned. What are you ma- going to make sure to communicate? Man, I would definitely roast some s'mores with them in my backyard because uh, my girls and I love love to do that. But I would uh, make sure they understood. And I tell them this all the time, daddy's weird, but being weird is being unique. And once you are able to really see your weirdness, see your uniqueness as who you are, you change your perspective of not only yourself, but of meeting people. I love meeting people and the weirder, the better for me, because those people usually have a better understanding of who they are. And I'm, I'm raising two young girls, daughters, which is a whole different, you know, psychological experiment um, that they're going to have to deal with stuff that I never had to deal with. But if I can raise two, two individuals who see themselves, who understand themselves and who are proud of themselves for being unique, being weird. I will have done a good job because that's where original thought comes from. And that's where uh, r- real true fulfillment begins. Dude, I appreciate uh, the, the weirdness that you bring because <laughs> you, it, it, it's powerful, man. And I appreciate the way that you answered that. I appreciate you being here and uh, I'm grateful to see what's to come. Caleb, this was a, an honor, a privilege and uh, the, the, the next step in our journey together. So Thank you and just keep being you, keep growing every day and empowering people. Thank you so much for listening to the Better Wealth Podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could hit subscribe, leave a review and share this with the people that you know and love.